At the national level, uh, the shop has trained a great many oh, yeah. statisticians, and you personally have trained 42, yeah. I think, PhDs. Yeah. Um, can you tell us about that impact on, uh, on statistics in the United States? Well, it had uh, great, uh, I think it had great influence on biometrics and the biometric society. Yes. Though, you see, what's happened is that medical research discovered statistics around, maybe around 1950 or something. Yeah. So there are hordes of statisticians coming out of the health sciences and yes. the drug firms and so on. So, you know, there isn't as much of the early work yes. of the shop. Yes, yeah. it's, it's more being done now by biostatistics departments, whereas it. the shop yeah. took, took that responsibility yeah. in early days. Yeah, yes, I think that's... I'd like to talk now a little about your first book, The Design and Analysis of Experiments, published by Wiley in 1952. That was an enormous amount of work for you and has been a classic, has been established as a classic. What do you think the message is in that book? Well, uh, that book is really sort of curious because because it presented, gave a decent presentation of linear model theory. And I think it had some status in that respect. Yes. But then I suppose the uh, big thing that it was pushing was randomization. Yes. Coming out of Fisher. Which, and, you know, there are all sorts of ironies in this because Fisher, I believe, didn't really understand randomization. <laughs> Why is that? Well, what makes because you he says, he said, well, you must randomize. But then having randomized, you can use Gauss-Markov normal linear model theory. Mm -hmm. But there's no justification for that. And so if you randomize over a finite set, yes. then uh, you don't simulate, in the randomization, you don't simulate sampling from a normal distribution, which is a continuous distribution. Yes. So, you see, the, uh, it's all very curious. Well, I'm, as you know, interested in the analysis of spatial data. And one thing that I've observed is that he proposed it partly to get rid of spatial correlation. Oh, yeah. And in fact, on page 64 of Fisher's 1937 book, I'll, yeah. I'll read you a uh, quote. Fisher said, after choosing the area, we usually have no guidance beyond the widely verified fact that patches in close proximity are commonly more alike as uh -huh. judged by the yield of crops than those which are further apart. What do you think of recent renewed interest in spatial aspects of field trials? Well, the, uh, this could well be fertile, but of course there are sort of big difficulties because one has to determine a model of, st of spatial variation. And uh, there will not be, uh, that won't be a uni standard thing, you know. Well, that requires the skill of the statistician, of the modeler, uh, working in a team with biometricians, oh I yeah. think. Um, it's this role of statistics in agriculture over the years that's been very important for the shop and for you. Do you see other areas where statistics is having or will have a comparable impact? Well, I guess there's no question about medical research. You see, uh, after all, what goes on in medical research is that people are ill, so one wants an intervention, a pill yes. that will cure it. And uh, so the only thing to do is to do a comparative trial, okay? and. Uh, you know, uh, back 
around 1950, there was some discussion by Bradford Hill as to whether one could use randomized trials mm -hmm. for medical research. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, big argument about it. Whereas yeah. now, it's, uh, you know, if you, if you don't randomize, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Can Kemp, you believe that? Kempthorne will blow you out of the out of right? the hall or whatever. Yes. So what about a notion of restricted randomization? Oh, well, such as no. it appears in spatial statistics. Well, the the idea see, that you could have treatments uh, to, to ensure balance of treatments oh, being yeah. close to each other, yet randomizing within that. Oh yes. Restricted well this class. of course this idea came up in the Latin square design or in randomized blocks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the uh, and uh, it's been uh, you know pushed off and on over the years. Uh, Rosemary Bailey in England mm -hmm. has been uh, pushing it, yes. but these people who are pushing it, it seems to me don't really understand the game. They seem to be very comfortable if. To use a, I shall give a slightly uh, technical thing now. Okay. If the expectation of the treatment mean square yes. is equal to the expectation of the error mean square right. under the null hypothesis, right. I think that's called validity. Or well, they, the they put this up for the validity, but yes. you see that is that's a very weak validity. Yes, and uh, you know one surely needs more than that, and the thing that one needs, you know is randomization tests. So distributions rather than expecta simply yeah, expectations. Yes, yeah, and uh, of course if one, if one just has two possible randomizations and you use one of them, the only statistical test that's available is one that has size 50%. Yes. And that's a pretty weak thing. Yes. So, okay. Yes, is there anything more you'd like to say about your work in experimental design? Because I'd like to move on to another oh, yeah. large portion of your work, namely genetic statistics. Oh, um, yes, well, we have to move on to genetics. Yes, I, I, think, I think we should. The, uh, um, let me preface this uh, question by saying that Ronald Fish Fisher clearly had a very big influence on your design book, and Fisher did a large amount of research in genetics. Tell us about your own work in statistical genetics and Fisher's influence on it. Yes, well, when I came here, you see, uh, I came to Iowa State. Iowa State was a leader in the world in animal and plant breeding. Uh -huh. There was an individual, he's gone now, called Lush, mm -hmm. animal breeding. And then uh, there's an individual who's still alive in plant breeding called Sprague, mm -hmm. and uh, so, you know, these had students coming here, all sorts of students from all over the shop, lots of students from Australia, mm -hmm. graduate students. These needed statistics, and uh, they needed to understand the role of statistical thinking in their genetic mm -hmm. modeling. Mm -hmm. So it was very natural you know, that I should. Now, of course, I really got involved in genetics way back in the effort to try to understand Fisher. I see. Because he would call on genetic examples all the time with complete freedom. Right. So if you couldn't understand a bit of genetics, you were in bad shape. So, I think you taught courses here in statistical oh, genetics. Yeah. I taught courses until, you know, until 1960, I guess, mm -hmm. and then I was teaching too much. Yes. And uh, so we got uh, we got other people in. Yes. To do some yes. of that. Yes. But so, you consulted with animal breeders oh, and yes, plant breeders. But, yes. But I sort of that that stopped somewhat around 1960 because some other people were brought in yes. to deal with that. Yes. Though I still go to animal breeding and plant breeding seminars. You know. Yes. So, well, there's a dark side to genetic statistics, and that 
I call it a dark side. That's the eugenics movement. Oh, yes. Now, Fisher, Ronald Fisher was very involved in the eugenics movement. Can oh, yeah. you explain what the eugenics movement was and is and give us your opinion regarding it? Well, the eugenics movement started, I suppose, because the quality of nations, in particular Great Britain, I guess, was just going to hell because, you know, people were coming in from all over the world and they did not have, <laughs> so it was claimed, yes. did not have the intelligence and so on. So th something should be done about this. Yes. And uh, Fisher was a, a big man in this eugenics movement. Yes. Now, this outlook has sort of come in and out, in and out, okay? Yes. And uh, it came up again around 1970 with an individual called Jensen. Yes. And the, he wrote a long thing on the Harvard, in the Harvard Educational Review. Yes. And... Uh, what know, did he write? Well, the idea was that uh, that something like, uh, you know, with very defective thinking, that 80% of the variation in human abilities, mental abilities, was due to genetics. I see. And 20% due to environment. Yes. So that's where he came out. Yes. But of course, that's, uh, well, <clears throat> That is arrant nonsense. It's epistemologically can't be sustained. Yes. They didn't have the data. Yes. You know, the only way to establish a causal argument of that sort yes. is by experimentation. And, uh, you know, they, these people somehow, did not understand have any, what for me is a decent understanding of causality. You know, causality has uh, bugged philosophers yes. for, uh, I don't know, 500 years, I guess. Mm -hmm. Longer. Or longer. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of fluff talk in the area. The only notion of causation that can be sustained is causation in the sense of human agency, yes. that is, or in the, the sense of an, of some agent. So that's why this experimental design really appealed to me, because one does get, in a weak way for sure, yes. one does get at causality, yes. and uh, one uh, doesn't uh, you know, one can't get it just by sort of looking at data.